this presentation of uh, female labor participation in Sri Lanka. Uh, presentation will be done by um, Mrs. Margaret Pereira, who is our vice chairperson of Marg Institute. Uh, she's a, she was the lead researcher. We had a couple of others who were, who were working on the research. Uh, one was uh, did the best study on all the research literature, literature review, and also I did some uh, in-depth interviews along with mm -hmm. someone over there. Uh, Hasita, you also did some interviews, right? Yeah, he did, yeah, did, did. Yeah. did something, okay, right. And uh, uh, our doctor Somaratna was involved in the analysis of all the HIES data. Uh, he went through data of 5,000 households. And before we get on to the presentation, I would also like to make a special mention to Garmini Korea Foundation who supported us in this research endeavor. Uh, and we have uh, Professor Tilaka Basinger who is representing uh, Garmin Korea Foundation. So, shall we just have a quick round of uh, introduction? By the way, my name is Amar uh, from Marg Institute. I think I introduced everyone here. So if you could just take uh, 30 seconds to... I'm Felix Morai from Open Media. Yeah, I'm Kamana Marvina from Marg Uh, thank you very much and I was just sitting here and looking around the faces here and there was one very loved face that I miss here and that is that of Professor Swarla Jaivir who would have been the first to have been here because this was one of her favorite topics of research so we remember her at this point of time anyway I'm getting back to the title of the study uh, I think most of you around here would have done a lot of work on this subject of female labor force participation. But uh, this one is a little different because the focus is different, a little different from the others that uh, I have seen even in the local research. Um, this actually, this, uh, this uh, subject of research came out of an issue uh, raised by Dr. Gunasilaka in the paper he wrote on very high human development for Sri Lanka and um, in that he raised this issue of low female, female labor force participation in Sri Lanka which was, uh, which was uh, uh, really notable because um, there were so many prerequisites that Sri Lankan females had for joining the labor force. I'll just go th quickly go through the contents of the report so, so that you'll have an idea of what it contained because it contained five sections. Section one uh, was the analysis of a sample of females from the HIES 2012 and 2013. Section two had an analysis of formal and informal sectors also in the sample. Section three had an analysis of narratives from qualitative research. Four, analysis of selected local studies by Anjali Vikramasinghe and five was a literature review of selected countries that had already reached VHHD status and tracing the parts that they had taken was done by Dr. Gamatige who was uh, not able to be present here. So I am uh, I'm, I'm presenting only because the report is very very big so I am presenting just a few highlights for you to get a taste of what the study was all about but um, I'll just uh, rough, right, quickly go through the list of thematic clusters that we uh, clustered about 95 to 100 variables. We clustered under these themes and I don't think I need to read it out. You can see the clusters. There's an economic cluster, demographic cluster, household size and composition, 
then we have education health amenities and equipment home ownership media and communication ownership of equipment transport and services now these are the areas which uh, en encompass the entire report the from hies data that in the quantitative analysis now uh, why are we talking about this uh, low rate of female participation and why is it something that we had to research about and that is because for several decades sri lanka has had a very low participation rates with low i think it was the lowest in south asia and it's not just the last few years it has been going on for decades it has never improved so uh, that that was the that was the issue that was raised in dr gunathilaka's paper on the paper was on um, sri lanka's uh, vision for sri lanka to reach vhsd status in 2025 and 2035 that was his paper so in that vision he wrote, he raised this issue now this was despite females in sri lanka having some key prerequisites for high female labor force participation they had very high literacy high education low fertility and uh, small families that is the many researchers refer to this as the sri lankan conundrum it is a conundrum because we don't know why with these prerequisites females are not joining the workforce why sri lanka's female labor force participation is the lowest for decades this is a much researched subject but no one has come up with any answers so i continue and the objectives of this research was different from the most of the other research that has been done on female labor force and females and the workforce the main uh, issue was strengthening of households that was the main focus of this study and uh, work or joint family joining being being a part of the family is in keeping with the normal values that we have about uh, family and household there's uh, no compulsion that there should be no compulsion of either economic need to work or a social need of the of the family as i said the main objective was strengthening of households before we think of encouraging females to join the labor force we must encourage we must encourage them to uh, look at the households and uh, strengthen the household and also empower the females so that they don't get into low wage low level kind of occupations because they need the money empower females offer them a choice of workforce or family in keeping with values there should be no compulsion of economic need to work or a social need of the family that was the objective of this study ensure a reasonable quality of life and as prerequisites for uh, very high human development it's not economic development we are talking of human development now this study examines the differences in the experiences of households with working females and a set of households with non working females and the unit of analysis is the female so very quickly i go on to methodology because there are so much of data and tables i don't want to uh tie you with all the presentation of all that data but i am only giving as i said the few highlights we use this quantitative method to analyze sample of households selected from the household income and expenditure survey of 2012 2013 and we selected that because one uh, that it had its data was of high quality second you can generalize it because the sample has been well done now the sample we selected was females 25 to 40 years living with a husband and children in a functional household so remember that that this is a specific set of uh, households that we selected and this uh, num this number um, this numbered 5000 4997 so 5000 households we analyzed data of 5000 households and in this we had 31% of working females and 69% non working females so you can see how it tallies with the low rate of participation and we measured their quality of life because it was important for us to ensure a quality of life of the female and we measured it using a large number of variables the sample represents a little over 1 million households in sri lanka and this we thought was a very critical group in which females make critical choices that have a significant bearing on the micro economy the quality of life of children elders within a functional family 
This also provided insights into life situations of working females and of non-working females, their households. And this became relevant to a Sri Lanka's path to very high human development status. And of course, it had pointers for policymakers and researchers. Highlights of findings, I'm going straight on to the statistical analysis. Um, we used two, some set of tools and we applied these tools in three stages, each stage progressively sharpening the measurement of indicators of difference. Yeah, we, we were measuring the difference between households that uh, had non-working females, households that had working females. What are the difference in their situations? We use a huge number of variables to arrive at, their, at these differences. So we wanted to get a uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, uh, acceptable rate of difference. So that is why we applied three tools. Um, and uh, data was analyzed, all the data was analyzed by sector and by income class with over 90 tables. And this is the first stage, a simple comparison through descriptive analysis providing a set of indicators from numerical data. Uh, there, were, there were about 90 tables. I am just going to highlight one or two tables just to give you an idea of what, it, what the tables were like. We just had a simple set of tables like this with WFs and NWFs on parallel and uh, comparing the two simple percentages. Now, if you take the mean, we see immediately we look at this, we see that the NWS had a lower mean, mean and median income. So, uh, the fact that they were in some way deprived, economically deprived, not I, we, don't, we are not saying socially, economically deprived is obvious from it. So, that difference is shown in this table. Then we looked at education because education is important for this uh, labor force participation. And then when we looked at it, it was, um, it was very surprising that we found the only difference was that working females had 11% uh, tertiary educated females, but otherwise the uh, pattern of education was very similar for both working females and for non-working females. They were so, what is it saying? That we have a set of educated females with similar education, some chose to work and others chose to not to work, to stay at home. Why? This doesn't give us that answer. But the te this, this technique of descriptive statistics was not very effective in producing a very firm measurement uh, indicators of difference. So the question arises, why did only 31% of females join the workforce and 59% did not join when they had similar patterns of education, if education was the determinant for female labor force participation. Now, the qualitative data, quantitative data could not answer that question, but we supplemented it with a qualitative study comprising narratives obtained face to face with a purposive sample of 30 females and 7 males and attempted to find some answers. Now, this was the, we used other, two other tools. The study adopted two other tools which progressively sharpened the indicators of differences. And for this, for the first tool, the analysis was based on 23 variables, we filtered all the variables, 95 odd variables, filtered it and came back. The man with U test uh, gave us the variables that were highly significant and this was only 23. Now what we did on the, with this is, we just gave a simple score looking at the variables. Some variables were enabling variables, some were hindering variables. Enable, some enabled them to work, join the workforce, others hindered. For example, a household with a number of children had a hindering score and the household with a small family had an enabling score and so on we scored the whole thing and then we came up with this table. Now we find that working females had an enabling score of 79 and a hindering score of 21 whereas the non-working females had a hindering score of 77. That's why they haven't joined the workforce and an enabling score of 23. Now, there's something interesting here, where, uh, where uh, the working females had a hindering score of 21%. What does that mean? It means that they were working, but working under duress, under a great deal of stress. Then we have the NWFs who have an enabling score of 23. What on earth were they doing sitting at home with this kind of you know capacity in the household? But for some reason, they did not want, want to join the workforce. So, uh, we, but we don't know why. Then among the working females, 
64 percent worked in the formal sector, but 36 percent worked in the informal sector. So, that is very important because that is one of the uh, um, uh, mortality, mortalities they used in order to accommodate their two roles, the responsibilities of get earning money and looking after the family. So, this says a, says a lot for government policy for encouraging informal sector SME, SMEs for females who have, who have qualifications. Some of them were tertiary educated females. Now, we had this third and final tool we call the capability index. Dr. Somaratna is the one who can talk about it, but I hope you won't talk about it <laughs> just now. Anyway, this showed clearly a very significant difference in the capabilities of the two sets of females. So, if you look at all sectors, the working females index was a plus 0.247, but in the urban sector, it was even higher, 2.245. So, the urban sector actually afforded more opportunities for uh, females with capabilities to join the workforce. Rural sector, it was less because it was a minus 1.154. The non-working females index was very low, minus 0.004. So, we know why they did not join the workforce. But in the urban sector, they had a 1.539 capability index, but they had not joined the workforce. In the rural sector, again, it was low. So, low capability of non-working females was clearly indicated here, but then you can't say that of the urban sector. Then also, we disaggregated all these um, variables by uh, sector. By sector, I have already mentioned that in the other earlier one, and also by income class. So, I will go straight out of the income class. Capability deferred by income class. Among the working females, the those those in low income in the low income category had, was had a minus 1.627 capability index. The middle income had a minus 0.374, and the high income class had a plus 3.354. So, if, among the working females, though as, as we said earlier, they were working probably under stress under duress, their capabilities were lower, but they worked. The high income class had a high capability. The NWFs had a, in the low income class, they had a low capability of minus 1.443. The middle group had a fair capability index of a positive one. Uh, the high, group, high income group had a plus 1.678. So, there again you see the NWFs having capabilities. In, uh, but not really putting them to use. Now, the assumption that WFs were under duress that would affect the quali their quality of life, their performance at work, wherever they were working, formal or informal sector, and also it will affect the quality of family care. Now, these are some of the highlights that came out. Some of the WFs with tertiary education were in low income households. Some WFs with tertiary education were in middle and low income occupations. Then a small percent of non-working females with tertiary education were in the high income households, presumably because the spouse's incomes were high and that may be one reason why they did not want to join the workforce because I think most researchers have found that when they have a good income, they do not want to join the workforce. Sector wise, the urban sector provided better opportunities for formal sector work, for work, working females to work. The rural sector provided more avenues for informal sector workers. Highlights of informal and formal sector, as, uh, this, this sector was analyzed separately as a separate sector and a separate section in the report. I am just giving you a few highlights that the majority of IFWs were in the low income group. Over 80 percent of IFWs were in the rural sector, more or less in the urban sector. Then 90 percent of IFWs had secondary education, over 60 percent of FWs also had secondary education. Now, with secondary education, some, some went into formal sectors, others went into informal sectors. IFWs with uh, tertiary education were in low income activities, IFW, informal sector workers, with Okay, IFWs with tertiary education, IFWs with tertiary education were in uh, low, in, in, not only were they in the informal sector activities, they were in low income activities. That was surprising. 
IFWs had on average a higher number of children and this could be the reason why they were not joining the workforce. But higher number of IFWs, informal sector workers, were in managerial positions. So their contribution as to SMEs would be very significant. Uh, the urban sector provided more, have, uh, more avenues for higher mean and median incomes for formal workers. And the rural sector provided uh, such incomes for the informal workers. So this is the difference between the formal and informal sector. So these are the characteristics that, are, that I have laid out in briefly. And these may be the reasons why, what led them to make their choice, you know, whether to join the formal, informal sector or out of the labor force. Now, we have a lot of questions there that we were asking why and wherefore and what are the reason. And now we come to the qualitative study, which gives some reasons as to why these things happen. And, and also, we are showing the different situations in households who were of females who were not working, households of females who were working. What were their experiences? What were their situations? What did they face? How did they face the uh, prospect of working? And how did they uh, cope up with the prospect of running a home without working? So we had these face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, and these revealed the unrevealed situations of WFs and NWFs and the impact on their families. Now, Inakshi was a researcher we, who joined me in this research. She went off to Japan. But she has sent a video from there, and we are playing some of that. In that she, is, she is talking about the narr narratives in the third person, and we have interspersed uh, some narratives at, in the first person. So uh, that is the way that goes. Now, I'm, I'm going to give a few highlights of what, that, what the things that were contained there. You know, some of the females, they continued working after marriage, but they had to change jobs. It was very significant. They were doing very high profile jobs. The moment they got married, they said, we want to continue work, but we have to change jobs. Most of them had to change into teaching. And this was not by choice. This was by compulsion. Either the husband or the father compelled them to change their jobs. Some disliked the change because they said, we were not trained to teach. We are science educated, we are working in uh, the private sector, etc. But we had to, we had to take, take to teaching. They felt manipulated by the father and the husband, in, in sort of forcing them to change jobs. There was an interesting case of one uh, female who was in a very high profile job. You know, she said she worked till 10 o'clock in the night in a bank. And she wished to change too, because she said, I can't manage my family with this work. But it was a proposed marriage, and the mother is daughter to be said, if you change your job, I'm going to drop the proposal. <laughs> See, this is the reality women face, you know, these are society. So we then, we, we, are, we accepted the proposal because of this high profile job that you have. And she had this work until 10 o'clock in the night. She had to keep to that job if she wanted to get married. That's what she did. And in, in, in overall, we found there was less support from husbands. Of course, they were working, all of them. And, uh, but mostly the support, uh, home support came from family elders. But family elders who were young and uh, not sickly, but there were family elders who were sickly, who had chronic diseases, then that became an extra burden to the uh, uh, female. Then we saw a kind of a absence of a partnership between husband and wife. Now, this is not to say that the, there was strong support in some of the households from husbands. He even in the, undertook cooking, some of them, you know, very busy doctor. He came home and helped the wife to do the cooking, very supportive. But what I mean when I say that there is no partnership is, uh, it was a more of a caring uh, phenomenon. You know, husbands who cared for their wives, didn't like to see them uh, toiling. They came and they helped out willingly. It was not acceptance that, you know, you and I are equal in uh, equal partnership in work. They did. That was not there. Because as you see later on from the dialogues, husband saying that my, my job is not providing, not, is providing only. You have to do the housework. So whether you work or not, housework is your job. So, you know, there was no real partnership. Then there were others who had dropped out at marriage, and that too by compulsion. They were doing good jobs, they liked their job, they liked their life, but they had to stop. Because uh, 
at times under threat and intimidation because one husband said, if you don't give up your job, I will give up my job and look after the children because my mother looked after us, so you have to look after our children. So that was that. And about rejoining, as many of them wanted to rejoin. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, there are no facilities for uh, women to rejoin in later in life. But there was this one fe exception, a female in IT who was working in Dubai, then came here and was working online. Uh, she had a small baby and she had to work from home. She had to had the baby on, uh, in a pouch and she used to do all the housework and the cooking, finish at 1 o'clock, get to the uh, online uh, tech, um, thing and start, start working because the mother-in-law was very uncooperative and refused to help her. So whenever there was a crisis with the baby, she left. Then she rejoined. She liked that. She rejoined eight times. Fortunately, she was able to do that because the, the, the Dubai her principals, they probably wanted her work. So nobody else had that opportunity. Then those who never worked, um, they, they, were, they, they never worked because they, they were uh, absorbed with family matters. But when those were over and the burdens were over, they have wanted they wanted to work. There was this emptiness syndrome that was real. You know, some of them were educated and they were skilled, so they could work, but they had not worked. So they were feeling that empty space in their life, and they said, "We didn't know what to do with ourselves after the children were bigger and we had plenty of time on our hands." But uh, we said we had nothing to fall back on because we devoted a whole young life to children and the family and the husband. Now they are gone and I'm not, there's nothing for me. Um, so that is the s story of... Now we are moving on to the... Moving on to the uh, videos of the narratives. Uh, this, is, this is Inakshi, by the way. She's talking from Japan. So I would like to start... Um, my presentation with, by talking to you about a few narratives about women who continue to work after marriage. The first narrative is about a local government officer. Um, she, was, um, she was a mother to three children, one eight-year-old and two twins who were younger than the eight-year-old. She mentioned that her husband was a businessman and that um, she continued to work after marriage regardless of having three children because her husband's income was quite in unstable because he was a businessman and hence she was the main breadwinner to her family. Um, Although she said that she was happy with her family life, she mentioned that um, she was stressed out during the pandemic, especially because children were not going to school and they were schooling at home. Now, at this point of time, she said that it was very difficult for her to manage online classes, her work, her studies, because she was also doing a degree and housework. And she said that she was waiting to resume to physical work again because she wanted to go back to work because she only felt relaxed when she was at work. And she was quite overwhelmed when she was at home. Now, this shows a perspective of a very tight household where they don't have a lot of, where women um, who are married don't have a lot of freedom after marriage. How are you managing two roles? while you are continuing working after marriage? You see, I first worked as a lecturer and I enjoyed my work. When my fiancé, who was not an academic, insisted that I should stop working after marriage, I told him, if you insist on that, I will break off our engagement. He gave in reluctantly. See, my work is my life. But I was warned by my husband that whatever position I hold in my job, my number one priority should be my home. He repeats this often. I continued my work and my family care, but under a great deal of stress. My husband helped me, but with marketing only and nothing else. Now my two daughters are teenagers and both have psychological problems. But I don't feel responsible for that. I'm sorry I'm breaking down, becoming emotional. But I feel, after all this, my conflict with my husband may have affected my daughters. I see you have a high-profile job. How did you manage to care for the home while working? 
When I continued my work as a chartered accountant, my husband agreed because of the financial benefits. I was able to combine work with caring for my son with help from my mother, my mother-in-law and a maid. But when my son needed me, I had to move to a small company close to my home. I felt a loss of, loss of status and prestige, but I had to do this. I have stability in my family life because my husband is supportive and my parents help me. But I feel sad about having to move, but I have a sense of satisfaction that I am managing both my roles. My husband has confidence in my skills in accounts. He gave me full responsibility for managing the household accounts. The next narrative is about an assistant accountant banker um, and, also a and also she mentioned that her husband was a lecturer, an engineering lecturer. Uh, she mentioned that um, both her and her husband were very busy professionals and that they had a seven month year old baby uh, she was happy to have her husband because her husband was very supportive as opposed to the previous stories uh, her husband was very supportive and her husband uh, was the one who took care of her seven month old baby because her as an assistant accountant had a lot of work and had a lot of demands from her workplace she said that her workplace at present demands her to do work at uh, work uh, of the company and the head of the department also wants her to do uh, his personal work and his friend's personal work which resulted in a large workload done at the end of the day she was exhausted and she was happy that she had a supportive husband who had a flexible schedule as he was a lecturer which resulted in him paying more attention to the baby she also said that she is in search of a better job because she wanted to stay away from so much work stress However, she emphasized that she was happy with her quality of life at home. Now we will be talking about women who dropped out from the workforce after marriage. So these are women who, who dropped out from um, being a full-time employee post getting married. It didn't happen all of a sudden or it didn't happen just at marriage. Sometimes you see that it's something that gradually happened with the increasing responsibilities. And sometimes we say that it's a decision that was made at marriage. So again, we have a divided room here where we have women who made these decisions, uh, maybe just at marriage or just before marriage, or sometimes with the increasing responsibilities that come with marriage. Why did you give up your teaching job? You see, I was first, uh, my first job was a I was, a man I, I, I was as an IT manager and I had to give that up to become a science teacher to have more time for my family after marriage. But I had no idea of quitting my teaching job. I requested a transfer to a school, school close to home to care for my autistic son and my small daughter. But they refused my request. Well, I hated giving up work I enjoyed, but I was compelled to do so. It was not just a job. I had a sense of mission, teaching science to children. I had a good standing among my peers. But now I am under stress and I lose my temper often, which has affected my children. I see my husband enjoying with friends, getting promotions, traveling. He does not like to be with our autistic son and the strain of caring for him by myself with all the housework is making me very unhappy. Sometimes I wish I had not married him but had only kept him as a friend. You see, he had a hard road to the top and he strives to keep it. But then I had an equally hard journey in my job. But whereas he was progressing and getting fulfillment, my job crumbled and with it my life too. I find that you have a good job. Why did you have to give it up? I have a degree in IT engineering and I love my teaching job. But because I am a Tamil, my husband insisted that I give up work. I wanted to teach in a university, but now I am unhappy person. I sacrifice a good income. I am now dependent on my husband 
but now I am resigned to this life. And um, another narrative about another woman gives us another perspective um, and gives us more insight to women and the reasons they drop out at marriage. Uh, she was an advanced level past uh, student um, and she joined the workforce as a skilled worker. However, she dropped out at pregnancy because uh, as a skilled worker, she had to lift uh, heavy items and uh, post post uh, uh, after being pregnant, she had to drop out of the workforce. And um, although she wanted to join after the child was quite old, after the child was a few months old, she realized that she has to take care of the child. So she continued to be a housewife and she had in, in fact denied the request which came from her office to join the workforce after birth, after childbirth. Um, what she mentioned that uh, was that she had to now look after her husband as well because her husband who was a construction uh, assistant had fallen and as a result was now bedridden and that she had to take care of the husband and the child at the same time she said that she didn't have enough money to take care of the child and the husband and that she couldn't fulfill all the responsibilities that she had to do because she was not employed um, although she got a loan from the samurthi service uh, which was 50,000 rupees to start her own small business she said that making led bulbs is a different story which she was able to do but then having to sell those led bulbs which was domestically made by her was a difficult task altogether so she was at a as, at a very difficult stage of her life because she was depending on the sum of the income which they got monthly and uh, a business that was not working out from the loan so she had the burden of taking care of a paralyzed husband taking care of a daughter taking care of um, the finances at home and the daily expenses with the sum of the income she got for both the husband and her and at the same time the burden of paying off the loan of fifty thousand rupees which she had used to start her led light business the business was not running because although she was able to make their lady bulbs, uh, there was no one to sell it to. Um, she also mentioned that um, she could have, you know, she could have asked for support from her family, but her, her, her father had uh, passed away and her two brothers who were in the army also had passed away and were not even being compensated on a monthly basis. So she was she is actually in a very difficult stage of life and uh, she can uh, she says that she hopes that everything will get better because she wants to provide her daughter with better education because she is good at her studies and she um she in fact cries when there's no online internet connection in the particular area so she hopes that things will get better so that she can support her daughter We're talking about the next category which is uh, women who never worked now. We will share a few experiences about them and uh, a few narratives about what they felt. Okay, so thirdly, we will talk about women who were never a part of the workforce. Of course, it doesn't mean that they were not they didn't work at all. They completed all the household chores, as you can see on the slide. Um, they contributed towards different household chores, whether it be cooking, cleaning, dishes, laundry, taking care of the children. They did all of that, but they were never a part of the formal workforce, um, which, um, which means that they didn't contribute towards maybe the economic aspect. Um, so we... And lastly, I would like to share a few male perspectives, a few perspectives from males who were both a part of, uh, who, who are um, husbands of both working females and non-working females at the same time. So we have perspectives coming from males who are uh, husbands to working females and non-working females. As a small, both of you are working. How did you manage to care for the home while you are working? I work in government and I have long working hours. I also travel a lot. My wife has a strenuous job as a nurse in the ICU. She has night shifts. She's on call. When the children were small, we hardly had cooked food. When we cooked, 
we had bare meals with rice, dal and a piece of chicken. My stress makes me get angry very easily and I shout at the children. But my wife remonstrates with me to be patient. I try sometimes to be calm. My small son saw me on a rare occasion when I came early, said, Some man comes home at midnight and leaves early morning. Amma, we never get to see father. My sons are grown. I reflect on my family life. We are trapped in our jobs and have confined our children to the home and destroyed their childhood. They did not have the life we had as children with mother and father caring for us. When my children were small, they came running to hug us as we came home and kept clinging to us. Now they are teenagers. We hardly see them. They talk to us only when they want something. My wife complains that I come home and watch TV, but I am a busy man and I want some recreation. Okay. Thank you very much for your patience with all these uh, technical hiccups. This is why I like just to speak without all this technology because that's what we are used to. We never had this kind of interruptions in all 40 years. That I <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Anyway, I have here uh, a slide which gives a whole set of uh, policies that can be, but I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm actually I'm not inclined to uh, impose that on you just now because I think every report that has written, been written on this subject has a set of recommendations which have never been taken up and Im implemented. So I'm not going to repeat the recommendations here, but I just, uh, I just want to hark back to uh, two of the narratives that were presented here. Uh, one was a young female who said she won a battle with her husband about keeping her job. So she was very uh, complacent, very um, boastful about that. She said, I won my battle and I worked right through my life. Then she came uh, very positive about her lifestyle, her quality, and then she said, I have two teenage daughters now, but they are both having psychological problems. And then on a defiant note, she said, I don't feel responsible for that. But then she broke down completely at the interview. I think she did the interview. And uh, she was flamox because she came up with a very positive uh, story and, and said, uh, well, I think I, my conflicts with my husband would have affected my children. You see, this is, this is then I take the, uh, take the next, next uh, story of a uh, father who said, uh, who was a very busy public servant. His wife was a very busy nurse in the ICU. They both used to come home late. And he says, he remembers when they came home, the little two little children used to keep up for them and then come running and cling on to their hands and hug them, waiting for them to, you know, talk to them and play with them. And that was the childhood. But he said, now they are teenagers. We don't see them. They are behind closed doors. They are working on their own. They talk to us only when they want something from us. And this father laments, it's a, heart, it's a heartbreak story from a father, you know, saying, uh, we, we uh, deprived our children of their childhood. I, as a boy, I had a very nice childhood because my mother was looking after us at home. And what is the childhood that we have given to these children? Because we have been working, you know, the economic imperative has taken over, forgetting about the social imperative that, and this is a father talking, mind you, not a mother, very emotive. And he says, now, now it is too late. That was how we finished the... Uh, so, what I, what I gathered from this, isn't this, the, isn't this the reality that policymakers and researchers ha have to face? Isn't this the reality? Now, in these two homes and in many others, in, the, in our 30 interviews that we did and many of the others, this was the situation. Because uh, they, they, were, they found that the they had uh, successfully worked, um, earned money, but they found that uh, th at the end of it all, there was no satisfaction, there was no quality of life, so there was no human development there. It may have been economic development, but economic development hadn't helped them at all. So there may be very, I mean, there were actually in these 30 interviews, many other stories like this, where with behind those closed doors, 
a child would have been crying out for a parent, either when it was sick or when it was hungry or depressed, crying out for a parent who was not there to hear. And gradually, the cry child may have reconciled herself, uh, himself to the situation where I am alone, I don't have anybody to care for me, so I will have to look after myself. And they became introverted, and this is how these teenagers that we are seeing in these uh, narratives, they are, they, are, they are into themselves, they don't talk to us, they are in their closed rooms. So that is that has come out of this uh, the men, f female men, mother and father both working out working outside. See these are fem these are these feelings, these emotions cannot be uh, tested on a with a man Whitney you test or a Cronbach equation. you know it is something that we have to capture through this kind of uh, dialogue but then, what do we do about it? So maybe such thoughts would have prompted Dr. Gunutiraka when he wrote his paper on that vision paper, that is, we say vision paper, because he uh, was led to raise this question in that paper saying, should not Sri Lanka forge its own unique path to VHSD status, to reach VHSD? Should we go by try, try to emulate other countries, other policies? So I feel maybe this, these thoughts would have gone through his mind. So I stopped there, but at this point, I want to thank uh, Dr. Gunatilaka very much. I don't know whether he's listening. He's not here. I want to thank him because both Dr. Somaratna and I, we were confronted with a huge lot of tables, you know, from the HIE's data, data set. And we just didn't know how on earth to analyze that because there are thousand and one ways of analyzing it. Would, what would be the best way of analyzing that people, other researchers can benefit from it and we ourselves can give a proper message from that. So when we were struggling, we spoke to Dr. Gunatilaka and a long hours on the phone, he directed us and how to analyze, how the best way to analyze, there were many ways, but the best way to analyze meaningfully. So I want to record my thanks, very sincere thanks and uh, Dr. Somaratnas for Dr. Gunatilaka's directions that uh, he gave us. So thank you, Dr. Gunatilaka, and thank all of you, especially for the patience that uh, you showed in the hiccups that we had. I hope you are also familiar with this kind of hiccups in your workplaces. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. What I was thinking, uh, Professor Tilak, and what you know, usually without going into this usual, uh, you know, question and answer time. So, because we have a uh, few representatives from Advocata, from SEPA, from Ramakura Foundation, and we have uh, other professionals here as well, to look at uh, how, what kind of collaboration, what kind of partnership we could go into for further research. What are the things that come jump out out of this research that may help? the type of work that they're doing. I know Asia Foundation are involved in working with social cohesion, and they're also, at the moment, working with you all on these development dialogues. I was thinking, at this particular juncture, where, where we're facing an economic crisis, people are um, facing dire economic situation. Uh, recently, I heard that UNDP had done a study, and in that study, they have a uh, survey, they have interviewed something like 3,000 households. And out of that, it came out that 50% of the households have their income, have their face in where their income has dropped by 50%, more than 50%. Uh, last year, in September, we did a uh, survey for UNDP on SMEs, looking at their compliance with um, human rights um, you know, standards or whatever. Uh, 40% of those inter uh, SMEs that we interviewed, when we contacted them again this September, that closed down their operation. Right. I think if we talk to them now, maybe 50% or 60% uh, may have closed down the operation. So what is the significance of this? I mean, why I'm talking about this is, I would like to get your opinion on some of the work that you all are doing especially SEPA, for instance, uh, uh, on uh, poverty uh, uh, studies. To see, actually Myrtle spoke about how, um, you know, uh, females are underemployed, uh, females with tertiary employment are 
not in the workforce. Some of them are not earning up to that capacity. So what sort of advocacy work, what sort of policy recommendations, I think that's the word that Merton doesn't like to hear about, policy recommendations. But what sort of advocacy work can we get in, be involved in? So that's something that I like to uh, uh, put to the floor. If I may come in on that yeah. policy, I have just one, one statement I want to make on policy, that policy interventions should come in a package. They should not, interventions should not come singly. They should come in a package, and a package that should uh, take note of all the variations that are there, the rural, urban, estate variations, and there are other variations. Though Sri Lanka is a small country, we have very varied experiences in different sectors. So one intervention wouldn't serve all of them. So I, I, was, I suggested a package of interventions that should uh, take into account all the very varied uh, experiences of uh, different sectors and groups of people. That's all I ordered to say about policy. Well, thank you for your enlightening study. I know we have been talking about this for a long time, Marga, various forums. We should understand more about female labor force participation, which has been stagnating at 30% for decades. So I think it's a worthwhile study. I, I would first appreciate the researchers and also the funding opportunity was made available. Uh, so I don't have any critical comment on this. Uh, I think these are the findings are confirming some of our early assumptions about why females are not really participating, cultural reasons, economic reasons and all. And we also know about the policy recommendations already have been given to the government and various institutions. So as uh, Amar mentioned, I mean, what are the uh, themes that we can actually pick for, you know, further focused understanding and from which Marga and other institution can uh, you know, take certain things and focus on them, do certain uh, activities which can actually contribute to certain transformation finally. It could be uh, you know, uh, reskilling women if women want to come back to work after you know, serving at the household. Yeah. Uh, so I would go for more disaggregated, you know, uh, activities to, to understand more and then whether we can devise something out of that. As, a, you know, as development institutions, and we can think of that. So, yeah. From the labor law point of view, I think, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I am a left, yeah. yeah. I'm left uh, appreciated her views on that, particularly from the labor law, how to make it conducive for women to we enter the labor market, even at a later stage. Let's maybe we could have that conversation later on. Sorry, uh, Professor, you want to say something? No, no, no. <clears throat> I'm just ready to hear from, especially from women, uh, what their experience is, especially if they are married. Mm -hmm. But even after 
See, we had rough, we had some of these stories where they said they were able to combine. Either there was an elder, somebody helping them, they were able. To, but then nobody talks of the effect on the child. And what we saw here was something that has not come out before about what children feel and how they how they react to their par both parents being out of the home. Parents are happy thinking we are giving them more better education, better facilities, better this and better that. Yes. But then you have go inside the child to, to find out what that child is really feeling. So we are, are we producing uh, childs with uh, crippled emotions, children with crippled emotions? We don't see that. We can't measure that. Yes. I think it's a very, very valid point that uh, uh, the, instead of pushing the government to come up with policies, if yes. this comes from the ground level, you know, institutions, I can share with you the experience of my daughter. She's in the U.S. Uh, with her husband, and uh, the child is going to be one year old uh, by end of January. She had six months of maternity leave. Husband also had six months of maternity leave, so they took leave, not overlapping, separately. Mm -hmm. So after six months of uh, maternity leave, my daughter back to work. It's very tough, extremely tough, because looking after a child and doing, you know, a lot of work. So what they did, they put the child, which is just at the age of uh, seven months, in a daycare. But the daycare quality is superb, you know. Uh, I mean, uh, there is a daycare uh, teacher assigned for each baby. So they do such a good job. So the child is learning a lot. So this kind of institutional arrangement you know, has to happen at the ground level. So if you are working positively on, positively on this, I think what we have to do is to, as you said, increase the awareness. Because we are losing very, um, you know, for the quality workers, like in Singapore, uh, my two of my colleagues with PhDs, they were in the university. Both of them withdrew from the labor market. 
just to take care of the children. The issue that Myrtle raised, you know, the quality of the child. So, oh, thanks. Yeah, so building up awareness at the ground level, probably institution may come up with their own flexible framework. There is that uh, often quoted uh, example of uh, Slaughter, is she? Maria Slaughter, who was the defense secretary to President Bush, who had, uh, who, uh, who had to, whose, uh, whose family was in another state. She was in New York. And then once when she went home, she found that real problems with her, to, with her daughters. And she was having this secretary of defense with her, you know, next to the president, such a high post, and everybody was envying her. She just made the decision to give up, and she gave up. Everyone was shocked, but she made the decision, gave, went back home, because she didn't want to sacrifice her children. They had all the material goods, but then she realized that they were missing out on something important, you know, the motive factor. But as Professor said, they don't have such facilities in Sri Lanka. Oh, we don't. Daycare yeah. centers, yeah. yeah. Very poor daycare centers. <laughs> I think there is one organization that escapes me where they allow the, uh, allow the females to bring their babies, their children. Precious, to, yes. Uh, to, yeah. to, the of, to, the to the office. And there's a group looking up. So I think if, I, I think if, if the employee is highly skilled, is expect, you know, uh, is who the employer feels that cannot be replaced. Maybe they will go into great lengths to retain that type of staff. But that goes only for very, very high skilled workers. What about the rest? Start an awareness campaign. Get the children to talk. Give the experience. So uh, one of our projects, currently we are doing a project, and it is from that uh, Nana I'm talking about. Uh, when we went to Nana, um, there was a group of uh, women who were complaining and saying that we cannot go to work because they are outside the work. And they were, uh, either they have to go to work, leaving their kids with um, rel uh, not relatives, but neighbors because it's a resettled village. So there, there were less relatives, more uh, neighbors. And uh, rate of abuse uh, was high. And because of that, the participation was quite low. And, but they were complaining. They were complaining that we don't have any option. So the, from foundation, the question that we asked was, did you ever think about, other than complaining, did you ever think about getting together and maybe setting up a daycare or requesting for a facility. And then we were taken to the DS office, uh, which was normally a ceremonial uh, activity when we uh, go to the field. Um, but at the, at the office, what we saw was a wall full of uh, uh, information that the DS has put. Because to get a proper idea about the area. So they, they, they were quite aware of the area situation and they had these facilities. And one, one facility was uh, their capital. And uh, when, when we asked our partner, did you ever approach them about this? Maybe you could start up something. Maybe you could initiate the uh, so, but the family is very supportive and they started to uh, discuss it right after the year. And now they are about to set up a day, they are just uh, set up there. So that the women of that area can go to work and uh, uh, child welfare uh, authorities are also in contact with them. So it is, in one way, the Sulaqa mindset is more positive into complaining also rather than exploring uh, the opportunities we have. So that, that when, when we talk about the uh, lowest skill labor force, that is, that should be an insight to that. 
You see that study we had done <coughs> comparative the countries which studied six uh, six countries <coughs> that had reached uh, very high development status already. You know some Western countries like Sweden and Scandinavian countries, some Asian countries. But um, what we found was discouraging in a way that. You know, some of those countries, they had very good facilities, daycare centers and uh, paternity leave, maternity leave, all that. But then also the later researchers, the more recent researchers, uh, research studies came up with this fact that with all that, they had a lot of weak or broken marriages, dysfunctional households, and um, also some teenage problems. And they think that it is because of the absence of the uh, mother from the home. That means they are well cared for. You know, these two uh, these two houses, the example that I presented, not that the children were left alone, uncared for. They were cared for very well. They were fed and clothed and bathed and all that by an elder or another reliable person. But then see the reaction of the child. This is what came out of this. Uh, of this and the, the, how do we face that reality? So we have to have much more innovative kind of uh, interventions. Not the, I mean, I mean, our people are very creative. Why can't we come up with some innovative uh, uh, ideas of how to care for children and leave the mother also some space to work? Well, that can take care of such uh, systems. I think yeah. Just touching on what Kaumidi said, you know, we experience the same thing when uh, uh, Anjali and I and Salam and uh, Gamini went to <coughs> Kalutara. People were complaining about various things. And our CSO partner was asking them whether they have engaged with the divisional secretary. And they didn't have any idea what kind of facilities that are already available. And uh, so we quickly decided to do a kind of a leaflet to give all the various officers, development officers, their names, their contact numbers, in case of uh, women's affairs, who to contact in terms of say, if it's anything to do with agriculture, who to contact, if it's anything to do with livestock management, who to contact. So it's like there is a kind of a gap in smell sometimes. They don't know that certain facilities, certain services are already available. And that's the sad part of it. Mm. I, what you said is no, true. I also experience in mm. Germany because my children live up there. Mm. The kindergarten are managed with the uh, foundation by the Catholic uh, associations mm. to 
there are people in kindergarten. So that's maintained by, uh, there are few dogs by government, but mainly by the church. I mean, mainly. <coughs> My children have been to the school's kindergarten. So I know how care they are giving to the children. <coughs> how much the patience they have with the children, because dealing with small children is not an easy thing. I find myself sometimes, I get uh, annoyed when my children are doing things, but they are really trained to, because I mean, Patience. that is the kind of uh, soft component that it should have in with this, uh, because we talk about abuse and everything, you can have mm. always, when you keep your child be around, it, uh, even if your child has been quite possible. Yes. That is a very really dangerous situation mm. right now in the country that we have to really look into. Children, uh, you leave it for somebody with whom you are assured of their, uh, uh, they are taking care of. But actually, what is happening is something controversial. So that I think in that corner, I see. I don't know whether that sort of a training our mm -hmm. teachers have, but I think uh, such NGOs' role is quite. You mean civil society organizations? Civil so yes. I, uh, yeah. I, I, I yeah. really, uh, yeah, civil society organizations. Yes. Can we have the, some of you may have already done some research work, if you don't mind, share with us uh, your findings, because sure. I think we
have a data center in Delhi, but that village has several facilities, right? Hospitals, Hospital, they school, schools, temple. They schools, yeah, but they don't have a data center. If there's a data center to look after that community, they may go out and work. Yeah. And the surprise, no? They provided everything, mm -hmm. but no daycare center for children. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a question. Is it that the community feels that it's a responsibility of the mother to look after the children or should be there? They can, I mean, they don't, is it because they don't see that need? Uh, you feel that, well, the husbands feel that. They had crushes, no, that was provided by UNICEF. And also, I need to tell one thing, uh, when, when it comes to across sector, the across sector is the highest uh, labor term, because uh, even the female uh, workers are, they are the highest labor term also, in the, if you take uh, mass probably, uh, I know that one factory, uh, 5,000 uh, labor workforce is there, mm. highest labor term. Mm. And they are providing a lot, and they are doing a lot of training and all.
already so estranged. self-worth. See, mm -hmm. when you work now, uh, Verite has done, Verite research has done a uh, similar research. I, they were sharing the uh, findings with them. They, they have looked at the cost of getting into the workforce. And one of the key things 
to come up from the qualitative research with that uh, research that is women who have left their jobs or given up their jobs have felt that they have lost a sense of sense freedom. of right they used the apital nidasana sali khasbandhi illandu so that self worth part of now take even my wife feels at this point of time oh if i did the job right yeah and the children they are no longer children they are grown men they say well uh, you know who stopped you from doing the job would you should have uh, done a job yes, so yes. Mm-hmm. that kind of so kind of pressure is their feelings there they know like it's kind of a dichotomous situation where you feel as if okay i should have gone yes. and also in, in social circles uh, people ask this question are you working right? yeah and you moment very diffident to say no you are <laughs> prone to say that or you you feel that if you are not working in a secular job or formal mode of employment you say no i'm not working i'm staying at mm. home also housewife but mm. you know home builders are doing a lot of work uh, i think the mail saw a glimpse of it during the covid uh, lockdown period what a lot of work uh, females do and in fact uh, in a social cohesion kind of engagements we have with communities uh, the roles in the communities roles of females somewhat changed they took on a more of a kind of a leadership role in peace building you could see right uh, i think deepan was in call it that what i mean i like to get kind of uh, your own experience or research that you all have done about think you were going to say something yeah. at one time uh, no 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 uh, i mean i can't as much to the whole uh, child care because we haven't done that we just we are more to the side of side of where we are like empowering women in the inner economy as economic access right so i found it really interesting when you brought up the informal sector mm. because we are currently working on a project where we kind of want to bring the whole because we were taken by the labor force uh, in simply to want to release the number you will see 30% of women and 40 if i'm correct it's 40.9% are in the informal sector so that's like kind of like a red flag for us because we want those women to come into the formal sector because all the loan and the legal um, protection Support. that they want to, that, that the government can provide them are in the formal sector the fact that they are going into the informal sector it, it like it means it's kind of like a like a it's not a bad thing but we prefer them to go into the formal sector right so right now we are trying to like kind of understand like where are these barriers are coming from especially for women to go into the informal sector because like if you take a look at the numbers the informal sector numbers are higher than the like female labor force participation rate itself so that's the kind of like a um, i like we are currently like uh, doing on but in terms of labor uh, force participation that like we have done a research on the labor law aspect of it mm. uh, because we are more focused on pushing for policy reforms so what we found out was in terms of labor laws so night time work part time work flexible time work and in terms of sexual harassment at the workplace those are they don't come under a particular kind of law mm. uh, so i think i don't know like two months ago i think the whole the government started talking about like they are allowing women to work in the night time like that allowing night time work and part time work but the problem is like they're talking about it but mm. the gazette and the official gazette announcements they don't come up so that's like the kind of like an um barrier that we are facing because like we are recommending we are advocating for these policy reforms and recommendations but the problem is the government is not doing it like if the government can't do it like no one like i don't think anyone else can do it because in terms of laws and stuff mm-hmm. they have no, the mm-hmm. whole authority of yeah. it so that's the kind of an idea that i can bring to the table yes question i have something to share with uh, okay so
it's also about choice. The yes. choice we are so for workers is. available, whether the work is decent in terms of the opportunities that are available, things like protection. If they are working at night, must be an maternity leave benefit. Mm -hmm. um, when we were doing some informal interviews with employers, we asked them, why are you not hiring women? It's pretty straightforward. They're like, oh, they'll get married, they'll have children, they'll take maternity leave. Mm -hmm. They won't concentrate as much. Yeah. The standard mm -hmm. argument. Mm -hmm. But as you were rightly saying, if the work is more flexible, allowing people to balance your work and your family life, again, well and good. But something that people saw with COVID and, and <coughs> the survey that Stephen Schaefer did about working during COVID was women who were employed or <coughs> even women who were homemakers. They saw increased amount of household responsibilities with everyone being in the house. So <coughs> no one's really looking at what happens when you have this increased responsibility. We did a follow-up survey, not with the same people, so statistically questionable, but you know, in terms of research <coughs> interest. Um, so there was like three waves of this survey. What we saw was each time the lockdown eased, the male engagement in household care reduced. So yeah. even though during the COVID, when everyone was at home, you saw increased male engagement in household work mm. and maybe looking after the children, the minute it eases up and they go out into mm. the workforce, the women's responsibility goes up tenfold. Yeah. You had homeschooling, mm. parents especially mothers who were considered the only ones who can teach children. Mm -hmm. So again, a mentality. It's not something that's true. But all those responsibilities increased on the mother, whether she was working or she was a homemaker. So what happens there? Where is the support? What responsibility is there of the state maybe, of the society, of the community? These are questions that we don't have the answers to. Mm -hmm. But these are questions we should be asking for the future. <coughs> because, well, when we did that first survey, we were hopeful that, you know, there might be a change. People see how much work is happening in the household. Maybe they will start contributing a little bit more. But, but that didn't change. <laughs> it was really stark how everything right back <laughs> pre-COVID times. Mm. We had asked that as well. Uh, if I may add, like, a few more points, Good. and I'm already talking. It's uh, okay. We also looked at the care economy recently um, because the ILO is interested in understanding uh, the demand for caring for elders, because Sri Lanka is going to have an aging population. Um, it's approximately 25% of our population by 2042 is going to be over the age of 60. Uh, what we've learned so far is that it is women who are providing care for elders right now. It's also one of the reasons why they do not enter the workforce. Yes, of course. So if this is going to increase some more, as much as we need daycares for children, you might need some sort of respite care for the elders. Because it's exhausting work to keep doing household chores, whether it's looking after children, whether it's looking after elders. The needs, these are some of the suggestions we proposed, but like you said, policy recommendations are just <laughs> float yeah, around unless they're taken holistically. So, we were thinking about things like community based <coughs> response mechanisms, mm. so much like the daycare system, mm. almost like an elderly daycare system where it's like a community run. So, people who do want to enter the labor force or who need to can leave their elders, be looked after by others, go to work, come back. It's I, be ideas. Yeah. I believe it was President Premadasa. I can remember doing some research on this long time ago. They introduced these community care centers. They had gray care centers for elders as well as day care centers for children. It's a community. There's few families get together and look after their neighbor's children. So there is no child abuse and you know they are trusted. I don't know what happened to that really. We did some research and I remember doing that, but I don't know what happened after the he went that, that would have fallen. One thing I wanted to comment on what you said about encouraging 
we mean to join, move from informal to formal. It's the same argument of saying move, move uh, females from home to work, same thing. But I think, the, uh, I feel, this is my, my personal opinion, that solution would be to uh, have uh, labor laws that look after the informal sector, not push them into the formal sector because there are no laws here. But make it secure. You can have a number of uh, labor laws which also um, cover the informal sector work and make that informal sector conducing to to people for women to more and more get into it because that is the only way in Sri Lanka that they can manage both res both uh, roles and re responsibilities. There's no other way. Actually, this formal informal division is pretty arbitrary, uh, as yes. Murtal was telling. You know, if the informal sector, so-called informal sector, comes under labor laws, it becomes formal. Now, in the case of Singapore, mm. if you want to run uh, even a small eatery. Yeah. You have to be registered. Mm. So it is formal. It's a government initiative. That is all that, that, that is required. Mm. So the formal informal division just goes away. But the work is part-time. That's the difference. Yeah. They have part-time work. And they are saying if we can do part-time work, they can look after the child, children, and also do their work. There's no facilities in Sri Lanka for that sort of thing. That's the pity of it, you know. Yes. Yes. And the home, uh, people of the home would expect her to behave as if she has no job. So that, that, that conundrum. I call it the new conundrum for females. But that is the product of the informal sector, I would say. Yes. There was one female that just thought of that example in one of our dialogues. Um, she's a public servant. She's in fairly high profile job there. Uh, she had uh, enough money to both of them were working to employ a maid. And she had an elderly mother there, but also a maid. She says she has finished all her medical leave, all her casual leave, no pay leave. Why? Every time the child sneezes, this maid calls her and says, gather in the lamet sanipane. So she runs home says child has sneezed. So that is she says that's my life. And she's in a high high level work in the in the public sector, I don't know what kind of work she can do at that level with the running home in the child's nieces. <laughs> so these are the realities that we have to face. You know, we don't get to that level of finding out what the real situation is. The more we get into that, the more we re will realize that we need more innovative, more creative kind of interventions, you know, not the ones that we are all the time talking about. Do we, in Sri Lanka, I don't know if there is one, at least the private sector organization and its forum or a discussion forum where these issues can be brought up. If there, I don't know if there is one, just, uh, just something that I've been wanting to check out that I could share. Uh, I, th I think the UNDP engages with the private sector, but that's yeah. more on uh, looking at responsible business practices, right? Not, but I don't. I'm not sure whether they look at this in this light, looking at it at from the work-life balance or the no. no. Which is trying to encourage more female labor force participation, which has been um, working with, I believe, five causes to try and encourage having daycare centers and things like that. That's something to But again, it's smaller. This is, uh, yeah. sorry, this is who is the? Uh, IFC. I the private sector arm of the government. Sir, I have something to share. So I have recently checked uh, uh, local authorities at Uru County. So, and I went uh, Bandara with So like, I can see after 11 7 kids, few kids running here and there, jumping. But uh, they are not disturbing to what the parents are doing. So it is more the leadership because uh, that municipal council was was, uh, was very uh, very organized, very organized. The office is like a private firm. The leadership was allowed them to take their 
children from school or from nursery or from daycare center, but I saw the difference. Some fathers, I mean male workers, they mm. keep their child with them mm. while they are working. So that's the culture they have created within, within the municipal that community. Mm. And that leadership, the mayor is a very young person. I think he is the youngest uh, mayor in the Asia. Mm -hmm. So he manages perfectly, even the ground is very clean. The other thing is now when we are talking about the formal and informal sector, that's a side which uh, children think about once they go to the school, they think about the, level, the type of documentation that their parents are doing. It matters in Sri Lanka, but it won't matter in the other countries because mm -hmm. our people go there and sweep the Flow, they are working at shops, mm. they do it. But when they sweep the roads and all, when they clean, when, when they carry the garbage, the dumping, so mm -hmm. the children uh, will be shy. So that mayor has uh, given a rule to collect the garbage and clean the roads only at night because the children of those labors go school work there. They are working with them. So they can see their father is taking garbage at home. So may I have even seen that and make the routing to the night. So actually this is uh, not this is not what we can uh, use in point the law. Yes, but this is yeah. the soft part. Yeah. Yeah. This is, soft, soft. Mm. Yeah. This is mm. the culture that we have to come up with the organization and see. And also, I, I feel uh, it's the totally leadership which can manage all this. Even in the uh, house, I mean, the, even in the home, it's a hands-on hand experience because I am a mother of two kids. My husband is a Navy officer. And I also have my mother-in-law mother -in who is a cancer patient. I'm managing all these things. It's my career because thanks to the organization. Because that culture is here. It, it, it doesn't bother about the formality or informality. But the culture, the leadership, the organization. So we cannot make it a law. But it's a case by case thing. I think that that's the thing we can change. Yes, sir. There was another point that came up in which is re-employment being able to rejoin uh, because the ma mother said now even when uh, when uh, when we have teenage children and we have to look after our little children when they are small but it is worse for us when they have teenage children we can't move out of the house we have to keep our eyes like link side on them what are they doing with their phones what are they doing with their computers it has come to that now so the mothers who are now said we are rid of the burden of looking nursing children now this is worse. We have to creep into the computers, sweep into their telephones. We don't know what they are doing. I'm very, very tense. One mother was saying, I'm very tense all the time because I can't spy on my children. But then I have to do it for their own protection. So this issue is coming up now in a big way in most of the households where there are teenagers. Hmm. 
Mental stress. of their failing, we can go ahead and go on to wherever, on other, other avenues. Okay, um, I have a suggestion. Um, these individual narratives are very, very informative. And so much data analysis has been already done, so we don't have to do it any further. So what we have to do is get together these individual narratives and mm. see what kind of solutions that are coming out of these stories, put them together, and organize something to make public aware mm. of these things. So that the initiative will come not from the government, but the initiative comes from the people. 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 Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. This, stu this study also allows for uh, trend of and trends comparison. So we can, if we can do it, it's a good thing to do the 2019 HIES. Do the same things, apply the same to 2019 and see what has changed over the years. Right? HIES 2019. What are the differences? We have to do the same analysis for the next year data set. We have year 12, 13 years. Mm -hmm.
Yes. They had, they were able to work because they had an elder person, elder relative, most of the time. But I told you the people who had paid care were the most dissatisfied because they couldn't trust the maids and they were giving a lot of trouble. If they had a very uh, young parent, they were very happy. Then the children were looked after. But as I said, these two households that I spoke of, those two households had young elders who were looking after the children. They were very comfortable, fed, bed. But then what was the outcome for the children? Very complex. So use, we have, people have to use their imagination. We have gone 10 minutes after our scheduled close. Yes. So if you have very understanding employees, you can stay here till 3 o'clock. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose we have to get back to work. So uh, what I will do is I think you all have shared uh, um, your <coughs> email addresses, right? Uh, have you? So, We'll share the, uh, maybe a recording of the presentation on the transfer. And uh, maybe take this conversation forward if there's any kind of uh, room for partnerships, collaborative research, anything you'd like to share, if you want to maybe get together and train the males in this country. <laughs> Yes, Hugh says not train aim. Whatever. Let's keep this uh, links open, conversation open. So, once again, thank you very much for joining. I think uh, we also learn something from you all we, we by sharing what the kind of work that you are doing. Yes. Thank you very much. And let's keep our uh, links, uh, continue our links, and let's see how we can work together and make a change for not just the females of this country, but for families on the whole. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.